Okay, and so with that, I'd like to welcome Will up to give the sermon. So today we will partake in communion, also referred to as the Lord's Supper. Um, I grew up in the church, and growing up in the church, I never really understood communion, even though we did it. Um, I honestly thought it was just a fun way to get to drink wine as a minor, and I would always tell my little sister, you know, how cool that was that we got to drink wine. And of course, we played the part well. We would act as serious as possible so as to not blow our cover that that's really the only reason we were doing it. Um, Normally, when a church has communion, um, one of the gospel accounts is chosen and they read out of that gospel account the Last Supper, the story of the Last Supper. But the different gospel accounts that we have the Lord's Supper in, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all contain different details that the other ones don't. And so what I thought we would do this morning is go through all three gospel accounts of the Last Supper. But what I did is I went through and I actually put them together so so it will come across and read as one continuous story. So I wouldn't try to follow along. We'll have the verses up behind me. And as you'll notice, we're going to be jumping back and forth, different books, different chapters, but it will all flow, which I think is very neat. And it's one of the cool things about the Gospels is that we do have different accounts that we can put together and get a more full, complete story. So Matthew 26 is where we'll start. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Jesus here is showing for the first time the connection between the Passover and his death, as he is the Passover lamb sacrificed for us. Then we go to Luke 22. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him, referring to Jesus, by trickery and put him to death. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So you'll notice here, they have devised this plan. They want to somehow get Jesus and kill him, but they fear the people. Jesus had a large following at this time, And that is what gave them hesitation. They didn't want to cause a riot. They didn't want to cause a public uproar. So they essentially said, if we're going to do this, we must plan to do this in stealth. But they didn't know how to pull that off. And how they do it, we will see as we continue. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, Jesus, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Now the breaking of the flask is very significant because that implied there was no desire for her to retain any of it. The breaking of it meant she was going to use all of it on Jesus. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For it might have been sold for more than 300 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Now, I think if we think about this, we could probably all relate in some area of our life where we look at what somebody's doing and we think, Oh, that's wasteful. 
or oh, they shouldn't do that, right? Um, an area where I'm guilty of this is with my kids. I'll see my kids doing something and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. And <clears throat> fortunately I have my wife to bring me back in place and say, wait a minute, who cares about that? Think about the heart behind what they're doing. Think about the reason what they're doing, the why. And of course, they don't have the experience and maturity that we do uh, yet to understand how these things work. When Jesus, but when Jesus was aware of it, meaning what they were saying, the issue they had with her, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman for she has done a good work for me? For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She was poor. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And the fact that we're reading this right now is a testimony to what Christ said has come to pass, right? This, the story of what she did for Jesus made it into the Bible, made it into the Gospels. And so what Jesus is trying to do here is he's trying to get his disciples to be mindful that the end is near. The end of his life is near. The end of his earthly ministry is near. The end of their one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with Jesus Christ is near. And he uses her as a great example. She realizes it. This is a time where breaking this expensive thing actually has value and has meaning because Jesus' life is about to come to an end. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them, how he might betray Jesus. Now this is interesting, right? Satan enters Judas. Satan entering Judas is significant because it truly shows how low Judas had fallen. Judas had fallen so low that Satan is just welcome in. He's welcomed in to Judas. And by the way, this is interesting, but don't forget that Satan was very active at this time, very active. Not only did he enter Judas, he also sought Peter, if you recall. Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan wanted to tempt Peter and was given permission by God to tempt Peter. So I think clearly Satan understands to some extent the gravity and the magnitude of what is going on. And when they heard it, meaning when they heard Judas and his essentially willingness to betray Christ, they were glad and they promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. So they were glad because they realized they had the problem. Judas comes along and solves the problem for them. Judas solves the problem of how do we obtain Jesus? How do we kill him without causing an uproar of the people? And so they were so happy they promised to give him money for this. And Judas then was like, okay, now I need to figure out how to do this. How exactly am I going to pull this off? And keep in mind, the solution was if someone inside Jesus' inner circle is the one betraying him, that solves the problem. <clears throat> now on the first day of, unle of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb... His disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? 
And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Some people have surmised that Christ had already spoken with this man and made him aware of the plan, and now he's telling Peter and John. He continues, wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, referring to Jesus, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us. So his disciples went out, came into the city and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the Passover. In the evening, he came with the twelve. So Jesus had a plan. He asked them to do this. The Passover is obviously very important in the history of Israel and for the Jews. This goes all the way back to their rescue out of Egypt. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them with fervent desire... I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is very significant. Jesus is once again explaining the end is near. This has been a desire of his to experience with them before he suffers. And after this, he will not eat of the Passover until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may recall that earlier, much earlier in his ministry, Jesus taught that he was the bread of life. And as he taught this, nobody really understood what he was talking about. It actually says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? So I think it would be helpful and beneficial if we go back to John 6 and see Jesus teaching that he is the bread of life, which will help us better understand the Last Supper. And it's the Last Supper which helps now put into context more what Jesus was talking about in John 6. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So obviously, food is very powerful, right? And uh, there's some things that haven't changed (laughs) over the years, and food is one of them. So Jesus says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, But for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? By the way, these are Jews, and so works were very important, which is why they asked what they did. Jesus answered and said to him, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. They weren't expecting that answer. They weren't expecting an answer of belief, specifically in belief in Jesus who's speaking to them. They were skeptical, and so they continue. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? They said, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
So they are making mention here of bread from heaven as a sign from God, not realizing that Jesus, whom they are speaking to, is the literal bread from heaven. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. You see, he knew their hearts. He knew what they were thinking. And when they said he gave them bread from heaven to eat, they were thinking of Moses. And so Jesus here corrects them and says, wait a minute, it wasn't Moses, it was my father who gave you bread from heaven. <clears throat> and then he's going to continue and tell them that the father sent him. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That is what Jesus did. Their response is this. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They're thinking that it's still food. And so Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the, ones who, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's saying, I am the bread of life that is coming from heaven from the Father. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is Jesus saying that everyone has the opportunity to see and those who see and choose to believe will have everlasting life. But the Jews grumbled, right? They, they've been doing this since Genesis and Exodus. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So this is important. Jesus is saying here that everyone is going to be taught by God. Everyone is going to be drawn, but it's those who hear and learn from the Father that will willingly come to Christ, right? The, when Jesus says those who have heard, he's not talking about just physical hearing, right? They're all in the presence here hearing Christ. There's a much deeper meaning here, which is hearing, understanding, accepting, believing, Let's continue. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father, referring to himself. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your, this is intense. He says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. Wow. Wow. They ate bread from heaven, but they died, right? This was physical food. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus, the bread of life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus knew what he was doing. 
He understood why he came to earth, and he is beginning to explain this to them. And it's not going to be easy for them to understand. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now keep in mind, part of the law was to avoid blood, right? You, you could not drink the blood. You had to cook your meat. You had to drain the, the blood out of the animal. The blood represented life. Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. And of course, he's talking about his every word. He's talking about people who believe in Jesus, trust what he's saying, follow what he says. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Let us now partake of bread in remembrance of the bread who came down from heaven and gave his life for us. We'll continue <clears throat> with the Last Supper. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So again... Jesus here is explaining what is about to happen. And what's about to happen is he is about to shed his blood for them. And this, <clears throat> this wine that they drink, the fruit of the vine, at the Last Supper is symbolic of that. As you hold this cup, this small cup... <clears throat> It's important to note that Jesus gave thanks before he gave it to them. And I love that because in reality, all good things come from above. There's always room to give thanks to God. And as Jesus told us, this cup is the new covenant in his blood, which is shed for you. So let's go ahead and drink and remember what Jesus did in shedding his blood for us. At this point in the story, the <clears throat> inevitable takes place. This is probably something that Jesus, without a doubt, knew was going to happen, but probably wanted to delay as long as possible. Now it says, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him one by one, Is it I? Another one said, Is it I? <clears throat> Jesus replied, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. He answered and said to them, it is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The son of man indeed goes just as, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, he was in the act already, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Knowing full well it was him. He said to him, you have said it. 
And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As I was reading this story, I was curious if Judas was around when they sung the hymn. We don't know. It's possible that as soon as he was outed, he just up and left. But if he did stick around, I think that would have been pretty awkward, right? Singing a hymn with Jesus after it's been, you've been exposed for your sin. We then have this interesting situation that comes up much later in the Corinthian church. By the way, this is important, but 1 Corinthians was actually written before the Gospels. So chronologically, the events we're about to look at happen much later than the Gospels. But what we're about to read is actually the first written record that we have of Christ's words at the Last Supper. It's actually from 1 Corinthians. So what's going on in the Corinthian church? Well, their conduct at the Lord's Supper had turned into something that was less than godly. Paul was very upset about this, and he used this opportunity to remind them of the importance and of the origin of the Lord's Supper. He also said that when we partake in communion, we should examine ourselves intently so as to not do it in an unworthy manner. So we'll read from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul here reminds them, this was intentional, that they received this information directly from Paul, who received it directly from the Lord. His point is that they're really without excuse for their actions, because they received something directly from Paul, who received it directly from the Lord. There's nothing, quote unquote, lost in translation, if you will. We'll continue. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. This is how important this is to Paul. He's telling them that if they take this lightly, if they do this as they're doing it in an unworthy manner, it's the opposite of what will happen, right? The opposite of salvation is they are guilty of the death of Christ. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And I believe he's referring to death there. Then Paul says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So he's telling them that if they would just judge themselves, they won't be judged. There's a play on words here, right? He's pointing to the reality that if we judge ourselves, meaning we examine ourselves, we look internally, and we find things that we are doing that we should not be doing them, and cease from doing them, then this situation wouldn't arise. Had the Corinthians judged themselves and judged each other in that close body, they wouldn't have found themselves in a position where Paul has to publicly rebuke them, and publicly judge them. Think about this. This is a letter that circulated. This is not just Paul talking to them. This is a letter that was circulated and eventually became part of the Bible. That is how significant the judgment and the rebuke here is from Paul. In closing, this is also a great reminder that judgment is at the heart of of the gospel of Jesus Christ, including self-examination. 
It is not until we recognize that we are indeed sinners deserving of judgment and in need of a Savior that we can truly accept for ourselves the gift given to us 2,000 years ago. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this day, a day that we decided to remember the sacrifice of your son 2,000 years ago coming to earth in order to die for our sins. We can't talk about this enough. We can't remember this enough. And it's so important that we set aside time to look at the historical events in Scripture, to look at what happened, and just to remember the magnitude of what transpired. This is arguably the greatest thing anyone has ever done for us and the most important event in world history. And I pray that we just keep this on the forefront of our minds. We remember as often as possible what set us free, what gave us this freedom. And we use this to help others enjoy the same salvation that we have experienced and to preach the truth and the good news of what you did for us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.